Book Club. I'm your host, Ryan, and we're back with the Rune Nation novel part three, chapter 29 and 30. So we'll get right into it. The battle has begun. Uh, but first, housekeeping up top. You can listen to us everywhere. Email us at podcastcore at gmail.com. Visit us at podcastcore.com for all of our info. Remember, that's C O R, podcast core. And then follow us on all the platforms because that helps us with discoverability. We appreciate it since we don't you know, have sponsors at the moment. Helps get the word out. Uh, leave a like and comment wherever you're listening. Uh, but the easiest way, how we've gotten to this point over the many years, is word of mouth. So tell a friend to push back against corruption by listening to the casuals of Runeterra podcast. So let's get into it. Chapter 29, scene one. So Hecram's Iron Order has now arrived at the Enlightenment Arch in front of the tower. And there's a stark contrast between, you know, these hulking ironclad giants that are the Iron Order and the lightly armored, more athletic looking host, which are similar to Spartans. We've seen that armor. That's where that draws inspiration from. And we also find out something interesting here from Callista's point of view is that this will technically be the first time ever that the two have engaged in combat because when they train, the Iron Order is so classist that they don't train alongside the host. So they've never fought in any capacity, not sparring, not real combat, except maybe, you know, a, a bar brawl or something like that. Definitely possible, but that's an interesting tidbit. So before, you know, they engage, Callista walks between the two standing fo uh, forces and gives a pretty good speech to her host that gets them riled up. They're already proud, uh, but this is icing on the cake. And she says, quote, they are no better than any of you for all their finery and wealth, she continued. They are weak for they have never had to fight for their place. They've been given everything on a silver platter every privilege, every honor, where you've had to fight for everything, every day of your lives. And that makes you stronger than they can ever be. Listen, <laughs> that's just a portion of her speech. And we've heard, you know, war speeches in plenty of movies in the past, plenty of fantasy. But these words can be applied to any of the class struggle concepts we've talked about throughout this story, uh, far from the battlefield. So good job, Callista. Good job. So after that, the host lifts their spears. They roar in defiance of the Iron Order. And Hecram decides to finally send the first wave of just 100 knights. I say just, but <laughs> he sends 100 knights. And Callista notices that he doesn't join them, unlike her, who's ready to fight alongside her men. And this makes a big difference. So we get a clash of the Iron Order. And it's not surprising that they are deftly picked apart by the athletic skill and determined host, and they're shocked, right? Because they came in on horses too, which is kind of an interesting move, uh, considering that Hecram knows the host is skilled with both spears and swords. So they're gonna use those spears to get them dismounted. Poor decision on his part, but he's also not functioning with a proper military mind, and Callista knows this. So Callista looks across the the carnage after this first battle where they just dismantle and pick apart uh, this group. And even Ladros is smiling brightly at the end of this for the first time in a long time, because um, he's been going through a lot, <laughs> if you've been following. Um, and he knows that this story will be talked about how the quote unquote lowborn stood up against these high and mighty um, classes soldiers and held their own, and not only held their own, but dominated um, in this first bout. And she looks across to see Hecram. He's kind of sitting there still, but she can see the fury on his face at this outcome. So then they move to clearing out the bodies because that's only the first wave, right? Is, you know, win the battle, not the war. Uh, at this moment, that's the battle. So the host clears out the bodies and they bring their own um, dead carefully back to the back ranks, the rear ranks uh, behind the arch. And they place them in neat rows. And then they mark their foreheads with these religious symbols to help them pass on into the afterlife um, since they've done their duty. And for the bodies of the Iron Order, they just kind of shove them forward and they build like a <laughs> like Lego. They build a barrier to help them against the following charge. And 
Ladros and Cal notice at this moment that Viego has now arrived at the front lines, and he is furious at this outcome, and he's yelling at Hecarim. And this takes us to scene two. So in scene two, we jump over to Rise and Tyrus, along with the three children, and they're attempting to make their way out of the city, and they're kind of struggling because they're trying to avoid these patrolling, bloodthirsty Iron Order knights that have kind of stayed back and are just ransacking the city for the hell of it. And they stumble across a ransacked building, and Rise has a great plan. He's like, listen, they've already torn up this building. There's very rare chance they'll come back, and we need to buy some time until sunsets. So they head into this building. Um, there's food and stuff, and they chill. And then hopefully no one returns. They wait till sunset, and they can head out of the city under this, this, uh, the disguise of night. They find food. They feed the children and talk a bit about what's been going on, um, what's Callista's role in all this. And even at this moment, as angry as Tyrus is, he knows that she's been manipulated um, because he kind of knows her heart. He's gotten a measure of her person. And at this moment, they start to hear the voices of knights again. And riots, like, you know, quiet down. They sit quietly and they wait for the soldiers to lose interest because they shouldn't come check out this building. They have already ransacked it, right? Um, and then they kick in the door. <laughs> and we move on to scene three. <laughs> so Ehrlich is watching the battle rage on, rage on, and he's enjoying it, right? He loves the carnage, regardless of who's dying. We, we, we've come to understand just how sick and twisty he is. And we know the cause of that sickness and that twisted personality he has, which we'll talk about once we wrap this book up, um, about the progress of his character's descent into madness, or even more. Um, but meanwhile, Viego is yelling at Hecarim, you know, send in everything you got, stop doing this. His impatience, his impatience is now leading him to decide to go in and fight. And remember, Ehrlich's, from Ehrlich's point of view, he doesn't know Viego's prowess. His, his view of a king is just this guy who sits on his throne and throws out orders. Uh, but Viego summons Sanctity, and he's like, okay, I'm going in. And Ehrlich, concerned that the <laughs> Viego will get hurt, not knowing, um, tells him, wait, I know another way. And everyone's looking at him like, why didn't you say so before? He gets a quick jab in where he's like, oh, I thought you guys were better than them. And Viego could care less. He's like, listen, show me the other way. We'll go with that plan. And Ehrlich is once again pleased. And that's where 29 ends. And this takes us into 30, uh, which is just more action. So chapter 30 has more scenes. It has four, but it's shorter. And we hop really quickly between all the points we were at. Just kind of do a quick check-in on what's going on uh, to progress this story. Uh, since this is the culmination of everything we've worked up to, right? Um, scene one, Cal and Ladros knew the next attack would be the final push. The host is bruised and battered, they're bruised and battered, and Hecram is finally dismounting, and the Iron Order is ordered to do the same. And this is the first time that the host is being shown respect by the Iron Order and will be faced on even footing for the first time. And Cal knows that this doesn't end well for them. Right? This is the moment they've worked up to, but at this point, all she hopes is that she bought Jendikaya, Tyrus, Rise, and the children enough time to escape this madness, because these are all people who have ultimately helped her in some way, despite the <laughs> madness she has brought to their shores. <laughs> and that's where scene one ends, and we go to scene two. In scene two, we're back with Rise and Tyrus, as these knights have kicked in the door, and they advance in, building in the building, ready to slaughter. And in defiance, Rise, you know, having been practicing on his own, yells no, and summons this rune prison, you know, shout out to the reference in the game, uh, for the first time around one of the men, and he's watching it as this guy's trying to bash against this magical barrier. And after that moment, Tyrus tells everyone to close their eyes and summons this bright blinding light, which is akin to a flashbang, and the group just makes a run for it, and that's where that scene ends. Then we hop into scene three, and we're back with Ehrlich Grail's group, and he's leading them through that back entrance, which we've seen this before, uh, and upon arriving to the secret door, he warns Viego, you know, I'm pretty sure Callista thought about this, 
so expect resistance. But Viego has been driven completely mad at this point, um, and his men are expecting resistance. So the door opens on the other side. There's custodians, and Viego already has sanctity out. He makes quick work of the custodians, and now is completely like it, it describes him as having flaming eyes. Like his eyes are just ablaze with madness, with sanctity in his hand. He's just carving his way through these people. Remember, sanctity is a magical weapon, so it also like sucks their soul and all this stuff. It's a spectacle. Gets to the doors and just blows them off the hinges with just a simple spell. And that's the part where he says, okay, the, uh, the rest of you guys, go flank Callista's host, kill the traitors. And he looks at Ehrlich, who's now terrified of the king for the first time, I think, at this point, because he's now seen everything he's capable of. And he also starts to question his decision uh, because of just how powerful Viego turned out to be. But he looks at Ehrlich and tells him, lead the way to the Well of Ages. And that takes us to our final scene here, scene four. And we get some Sakuga moments between Ladros and Callista as they fight to their last breath. They're weaving in and out between each other and just dispatching the last bit of men. And as the commotion behind them grows, Callista yells to the rear flank or the rear rank, hey, engage Viego's men. Don't let them crash in on us. And Ladros, or Ladros yells at Callista that she needs to personally go attempt to stop Viego. Because if not her, then who, right? Um, because they're all dead anyways. But before she could turn around, in front of her is looming her ex fiance Hecarim. And that's where the chapter ends. So this is absolute madness. <laughs> um, but this, these two chapters, though being short uh, and being so dense with everything going on in all the different plot lines and the subplots, um, this solidifies in my mind that this show is going to make, if they decide to do, or this show, this book, uh, would make a great TV series, especially with the pre-existing League of Legends fan base, because it's not really doing anything new, which Hetch and I have spoken about, but it does it well within this lore. And the story beats just work so well for a screenplay or um, however you want to chop up the storyboard uh, that fits into that Game of Thrones X kind of uh, presentation. So people are already primed for it, and these chapters reinforce that. So, still enjoying myself. This this is so, so good. You, I fly through these chapters. I know these, I know these episodes don't come out as fast as I read through the chapters, um, because you know there's a lot of a lot of work in between the two. But uh, it's it's a banger read. And even after listening to all of this, if you've been sticking around, I appreciate it. Uh, go read it yourself because it's fun. It's a good read. Uh, that being said, that's the end of this episode. Uh, thanks for listening as always. We'll be back soon with the next episode. I appreciate your patience. And as Hedge always says, take care, everybody.